But, but the reason for showing that earlier uh, one-line diagram was that uh, all these uh, uh, subsystems are three-phase. So we have to deal with three-phase voltages and currents. Okay. So, you know, we may have these three voltages, VA, VB, and VC, and they have equal amplitudes, but they are displaced with respect to each other by 120 degrees, or uh, 2 pi over 3 radians. <coughs> so that is what's shown in this uh, diagram A, and we can represent them as phasors. For example, if you take this as the time origin, where phase A voltage is peaking, if you take this as T <coughs> equal to 0, then VAN would be along the real axis, and uh, given the sequence of ABC, you'll see that uh, VBN would be here and VCN would be over here. <coughs> okay, so next thing we'll see is uh, how we, we can analyze <coughs> these uh, three phase circuits under balanced conditions by per phase analysis. So here is a three-phase uh, source and uh, three-phase load here. So it's balanced. Each phase has an impedance of Z sub L, and these three voltages are equal in magnitude or amplitude and uh, 120 degrees displaced with respect to <coughs> each other. So in a circuit like this, if you look at it in time domain, I, IA plus IB plus IC by Kirchhoff's current law, if you were to apply here, would be zero. You can say the same thing in phasor domain, that IA plus IB plus IC would be equal to zero, and that is shown uh, in this diagram here. So we can uh, be sure that that's the case. And if that's the case, then, uh, you know, what difference does it make if I connect these two points over here? Now, uh, while that's a rhetorical question, the answer is, it makes no difference, okay? Because IA plus IB <coughs> plus IC would equal this current IN here, and this would be equal to zero. IN would be zero, because IA plus IB plus IC, they add up to zero, so if I apply Kirchhoff's current law at this point, uh, even though this wire didn't exist, I can hypothetically insert that wire, but there'll be no current on it, so it, it really makes no difference. Because in a balanced circuit, this point little n and this point capital N, they are both at the same you know, potential. Okay. So if that's the case, then I can just analyze uh, uh, just one phase, and I can forget about this rest part, the rest of the circuit over here, like this here. Okay. So that is what we are doing here. We are analyzing this three-phase circuit on a per-phase basis. We shouldn't call it single phase. We should call it per phase, OK? <clears throat> so we have this voltage VAN here, and this load, ZL, and uh, this point N, and this point, capital N, they're connected by this hypothetical wire, which has no impedance whatsoever. <clears throat> so in this circuit, we can very easily calculate the current given this VAN and ZL over here, and let's say that this current for this voltage is over here. And once we have this phase voltage and uh, this phase current for phase A, we can immediately draw the, the voltages and the currents for the other two phases, knowing that they are displaced by 120 degrees, respectively. So we can draw VBN, VCN, and similarly, we can draw IB and IC. So we have the voltages and currents in all three phases by means of this per phase analysis very quickly. So moving on here, <clears throat> we should also realize that uh, you know the, when you have these three phases, uh, we always have coupling. We often forget, but uh, we always have coupling. If you have a, a generator, well, in this generator, if you have three phases, all three phases are coupled. Similarly, if you have a transmission line, uh, you have uh, three uh, three-phase uh, transmission line, all those three phases are coupled. Same thing in transformers here. 
So what we see here, again under balanced condition, that we have uh, equal self-impedances and then we have equal <coughs> mutual between any two phases over here. So even in this case, we can draw uh, on a per phase basis uh, this circuit uh, from A to B, this capital A, we have this impedance and that impedance can be written in terms of the self as well as the mutual uh, impedances like this here. So the next thing we'll look at in this uh, balanced circuit, line-to-line uh, -line voltages. So what do we mean by that? We have these phases A, B, and C. Uh, what are the voltages uh, from line to line? What is what is VAB? So VAB, uh, maybe I should erase this here, right here. VAB is voltage of A minus voltage of B. So that's what we are doing. And maybe you can add N over here for the sake of uh, completeness. So what you see is that we have VAN and uh, VBN over here, but if you put a minus sign, uh, VBN is over here. And uh, when you add them up, you get VAB. So this VAB turns out to be square root of 3 times VAN and uh, with an angle of uh, this 30 degrees over here, like this. Okay? So we, we can also calculate these line-to-line -line voltages, VAB, VBC, and VCA over here. Okay. The next thing is uh, uh, Y delta transformation or delta Y transformation. Uh, quite often, loads can be delta connected as shown here. Between phases A, B, and C, they may be connected like this here. <coughs> but it's possible to analyze them as if they were connected in a Y as shown here. Okay, under balance condition, this impedance ZY would be just Z delta divided by 3. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Next, uh, We'll look at uh, power flow in an AC system. Uh, for example, let's say you have AC system 1. Uh, let's represent it by a voltage source Vs. And we have AC system 2. Let's represent this by an AC source V sub R. And they're connected by a transmission line <coughs> on a per phase basis where we can assume it to be purely uh, inductive. Uh, because uh, resistance is a very small uh, component of it uh, by, by design. Otherwise, we'll have quite a bit of losses. Okay? So in this case, depending upon the operating condition, uh, let's say that uh, V sub R, we take it as a reference, that is, this is uh, at an angle uh, zero, and let's say v, Vs here has this uh, magnitude, but it's an angle phi over here. As, uh, a delta, rather, delta, right here. Okay? And the current then may turn out to be this. Uh, this current here, depending upon the magnitudes of Vs, Vr, and uh, the value of delta over here. But, you know, the Kirchhoff's voltage law has to be satisfied that Vs is equal to Vr plus J XL I. Okay? So that's what this uh, phasor diagram is showing. And uh, <clears throat> so in this circuit, uh, interesting thing is that uh, when you look at the power that is transferred to V sub R, or, you know, if this lossless is the same as the power that is supplied by Vs, so this power here, or this power over here, P, uh, they are the same, and this power is given by this expression over here. So uh, power transfer is uh, the product of these two voltage magnitudes divided by the reactive in impedance between them and sine of delta. So in AC systems, <coughs> power transfers are flows downhill on angle. Okay, So maybe I should even write it down here. Downhill <laughs> on angle. So it's really the angle which determines the direction of power. Uh, unlike in DC system, 
if you had two DC voltage sources connected by a resistance, then the power would flow from higher DC voltage source to a lower amplitude magnitude DC voltage source. But in this case, <coughs> it's really flowing downhill on, on angle, and uh, you can see the plot of this equation over here. Okay. So once again, in this case, if this delta is positive for V sub S, this power here would be, in the direction shown, positive. Yeah. So it doesn't depend upon the magnitude of Vs uh, in relation to Vr, but rather the phase angle of Vs being uh, positive compared to Vr. Okay? <clears throat> and then we can talk about reactive power. Again, the same uh, AC system. And we can see the equation for reactive power. The reactive power that is supplied to this uh, AC system. Oh, I, I goofed this up here. Q sub R here, like this here. And you'll see that it is given by this expression over here. So what, what is it telling us? It's telling us that, uh, let's say, just to simplify it, uh, let's say the power transfer is very small. So delta is uh, small. And therefore, cosine of delta is, let's say, 1 over here. <coughs> OK, let's assume that under very light power transfer conditions. Then this equation becomes, for QR, uh, I can take V sub R outside, X, it becomes uh, Vs minus Vr, right? So it's telling us is that this reactive power being supplied to this AC system 2, AC system 1, is given by this expression here. So the reactive power is flowing uh, depending upon the, the difference in the amplitude of these two system voltages. And normally, uh, these two system voltages are very e close to each other because we would like to keep both of them at their nominal 100% values. So uh, the supply of reactive power to AC2 really becomes a local affair. Okay. So that's uh, somewhat a very uh, involved concept, but we'll see later on in uh, one of our modules that how we supply reactive power locally. But it's very difficult to transfer this reactive power to AC2 from AC1 uh, because this Vs and Vr are approximately the same magnitude. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, then we talk about uh, per unit quantities. When we are dealing uh, with equipment and power systems, <clears throat> this equipment could be varying in a wide range in terms of voltages, currents, and power handling capabilities. You may have a very small transformer, maybe a few kVA, and you may have a very large transformer, maybe 100 mVA. Okay? But uh, so their resistances, leakage inductances, and so forth in ohms would be uh, in a very wide range, okay, depending upon their size. But if you normalize them, that is, put them in per unit. So per unit is nothing but normalizing with respect to their ratings. Then their values would be in a very narrow range. Okay? So that's the, the advantage of uh, using per unit quantities that are often used in power systems. <coughs> so to normalize any uh, resistance or inductance or impedance, we make use of uh, uh, this uh, V base over I base uh, as, as finding out the base quantity with which we'll normalize in ohms or in uh, MOS, this symbol didn't come through here, one over the impedance symbol. That is I base over V base. So for uh, admittances and so forth, we will use this. And for power, we'll use the product of V base and I base. So usually, you know, we take the, the rating of, a, of an apparatus as the base value, okay? So we'll take the, the voltage rating of an apparatus as the voltage base and uh, the current rating of that apparatus as a current base. And if, if we do that, then we will get this impedance base, admittance base, and the power base here. 
And then the per unit value is nothing but the actual value divided by this base value over here. Okay. So that's all there is to it. So uh, you know, we can convert from different uh, base values, we'll see later on in our discussion. But for now, it's sufficient to say that uh, per unit value is just a normalized value, which is the actual value, whether it's in ohms or mohs or in uh, uh, volt amperes or watts. Uh, but we divide that by its uh, base value, and therefore it becomes uh, unitless, okay, per unit value. The other thing we should recognize is the, the energy efficiency of apparatus. It's extremely important in power systems because we are dealing with very large quantities of power. So we have this power coming in, power coming out, uh, and some of it is being lost as P loss. So the energy efficiency really is the output power divided by the input power here. So we'll try to see, keep this uh, as high as possible. So now let's move on to uh, electromagnetic concepts. And I said early on, uh, we need them for understanding transmission lines, transformers, and uh, synchronous generators, for example. Okay. So the place to begin is uh, this Ampere's law, which says that if you have a conductor which is in which the current is going in, shown by the tail of this arrow, then this is the direction of the flux lines, right this here. <clears throat> if the current is coming at us uh, and represented by the tip of an arrow, then the flux lines would be in this uh, counterclockwise direction here. And uh, if you have a bunch of current uh, conductors in which some are carrying currents into the, the plane, some are coming out, we can still draw a, uh, any arbitrary path <clears throat> and along which we can define this uh, uh, magnetic field intensity H and uh, uh, during this uh, differential length DL over here. So what this Ampere law is telling us is that if we take the line integral of this H uh, magnetic field intensity over this closed path over here, uh, you know, that line integral would equal to all the sum of all the currents that are being enclosed. Okay? So that's Ampere's law <coughs> in a very general way, but in our case we can simplify it a great deal, and that is done by means of this example, uh, 2 9, in this chapter here, where we have this uh, toroid over which a coil is wound with uh, n turns, and it has this current going into it, I, and we can then calculate what this uh, magnetic field intensity in this uh, core would be, uh, given the geometry of this core. <coughs> and uh, the other thing we have to realize that, uh, uh, you know, we are dealing with uh, ferromagnetic materials as well as air gap, and uh, when we have ferromagnetic materials, uh, BH curve is uh, shown in this here, which we can simplify by a single characteristic like this. And you can see that it begins to saturate at this knee over here, and as compared to that, uh, the BH for the air gap would be somewhere like this here. Okay, So the slope is uh, mu naught here, whereas mu sub m over here. So in ferromagnetic materials, uh, mu sub m compared to mu, mu naught uh, for air could be thousand to a few thousand times greater. <coughs> okay. So uh, once we have H, uh, we can find H sub m, let's say, in the score. We can find B sub m, and uh, we can then find uh, uh, the flux that's crossing. Uh, any area here, which is a, a, a sub m times b sub m, and then we can also find the flux linkage, which will be n times, which is the number of turns times the flux that's being linked over here. <coughs> so we can find the, the flux linkage as well. Now it's also very useful to know 
what this inductance is. Usually, in our circuit scores, this inductance looks like this, right? And this is the voltage, and this is the current, and uh, we say E is equal to L di dt. But this L is made up of uh, this uh, uh, circ uh, geometry here and the number of turns that it has. And that's what we will see here. So let's say that we have this uh, toroid <coughs> on which we put this coil. And uh, let's say that current I is going into it. And uh, let, let's say that it's not in saturation. Okay. So this current would then, uh, by Ampere's law, if you have n turns and you divide this by the mean path length over here, L sub m, uh, that will uh, give us the magnetic field intensity uh, in this core. If you multiply that by the permeability of this core, mu sub m, that will give us the flux density. If you multiply by this cross-sectional area <coughs> through which this flux is crossing, then that will give us the, the flux uh, that is uh, in this core. And, uh, if you have n turns, if you multiply by that, you'll get the flux linkage of this coil, and this inductance is uh, this flux linkage divided by the current here. So <clears throat> looking at this, uh, uh, this diagram over here, we can immediately see that this inductance is proportional to number of turns squared divided by this quantity, which we'll call reluctance, like this here. So this reluctance, just like uh, a wire has resistance, uh, this reluctance is uh, equal to the length, mean path length over here divided by the permeability of this core and this cross-sectional area of this core here. Okay. So it's really sort of a, you know, the core property that this inductance is representing. Uh, the other thing we have to look at in these circuits is uh, the induced EMFs due to rate of change of flux with time. So that's uh, given by Faraday's law. And what it's telling us is that this E is equal to induced EMF is N d phi dt. <coughs> okay? But it's very important to define the, the direction of flux and the polarity of voltage that this equation is representing. Otherwise, it could be minus and d phi dt, OK? So why do we not include that minus sign? Well, let's try to justify that here. <clears throat> let's say that I have this core, and uh, uh, very carefully I have drawn this uh, coil as shown here, OK? And let's say that the flux, phi sub t, uh, is uh, well, uh, let's not define the flux yet, the direction of flux yet. So let me erase this out here, OK? OK, so uh, let's say that I define my voltage polarity across this coil like this here. And uh, just temporarily or momentarily, let me define, using passive uh, sign convention, current going into this positive polarity voltage here, this current I over here. So if I have this current going in like this, you can immediately see that the flux would be going up like this over here. Okay. So now I have the flux direction and the voltage polarity. And let me erase this current here now. Okay. So uh, because this flux could be coming in because of some other coil. See, this expression that I have written doesn't depend on having any current in this coil over here. This flux could be caused by some other means, another coil which may be placed on this core. So if you have this polarity voltage that you have defined and uh, this direction of flux, then these two are related by uh, this ex Faraday's law expression like this here, where indeed there is uh, no negative sign. It's a plus sign here. So what I'm trying to say is that, again, being able to define the, 
direction of flux is very important uh, in order to be able to write this uh, Faraday's law equation. And it's, the other thing is we have to note is independent of I. Okay? The other thing we'll look at is uh, <coughs> leakage flux. So let's say that uh, we would like flux to go through this air core, or air gap rather, in this uh, magnetic structure, and we are putting a coil here of uh, and turns. But uh, in magnetic structures, it's very hard to avoid leakage fluxes. So uh, this coil is producing flux. Most of it would come through this air gap, but some of it would be leaking out over here in this window over here, okay? We don't worry about this uh, leakage current so much in electrical circuits because the conductivity of copper, for example, of a wire is 10 to the 24 times that of air, okay? Whereas in magnetic structures, the permeability of uh, the magnetic structure is probably, uh, so this core, the permeability is no more than 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 times that of air, okay? So that's the reason why uh, we really, uh, you know, often cannot ignore this leakage flux, okay? So when we have this uh, uh, flux pattern like this, we can simplify by saying that, let's say, this phi sub m is the flux which uh, links all end turns and is crossing the air gap, where phi, this leakage flux is the flux which also links all end turns but doesn't cross the air gap at all, okay? Although, you know, reality is that uh, this, some of the leakage flux is linking only some of the turns, not all the turns, yeah. But that's, uh, uh, you know, a simplified uh, representation over here. And what we can say <coughs> is that uh, we, uh, you know, this leakage flux phi sub L leads to this leakage inductance and this uh, phi sub M leads to uh, this magnetizing inductance, and I'll not go through the equations here, but uh, we can represent that uh, original circuit uh, by uh, an equivalent uh, core where we only have the magnetizing flux. I call it magnetizing because it's uh, all in the core and it's passing through the air gap that we would like it to, and uh, the effect of this leakage flux and the leakage inductance is explicitly taken out over here, and then we can also put the resistance here. So if you can do that, I have not gone through the equations, but you can easily go through them in this chapter, and you'll see that uh, uh, this analysis becomes very uh, straightforward when we apply this to transformers, for example, and deriving their equivalent circuit. So the bottom line is that uh, in this picture, we had uh, uh, in this core, both the leakage flux as well as this magnetizing flux, which was going through the air gap, but we have simplified it. Not, uh, we can represent it such that we only have the magnetizing flux here, and the effect of leakage is uh, taken care of by this external leakage inductance and the drop across it, and we can also put the resistance of this coil here. Okay, so uh, doing this type of analysis then, uh, would make us move very f fast when it comes to analyzing transformers. <clears throat> so I think uh, with this, we have uh, uh, b basically come to an end uh, in this module and summarizing. Uh, we have looked at the overview of uh, power systems and how this uh, landscape is changing with distributed generation and uh, open access and utility deregulation. And then we also have reviewed electric and magnetic circuit concepts, which will be very useful when we come to uh, later modules. So thank you very much.